Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast under your bed. Oh, how regal. How <laughs> regal for this movie. Welcome back, y'all. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> We're coming back to you again with a yes. fun movie. We got one of our personal favorites, one of my <laughs> LA's, OG yes. Scream 1996, y'all. Uh, if you haven't seen it, what the fuck's wrong with God. you? Uh, it's classic at this point. Uh, and basically, it's a masked killer stalks a group of teens in a super meta horror classic. Um, it's a blast, and it's just everything you want out of a slasher that is also very meta and critiquing the genre. And it just has so much fun along the way. This was this whole, huge! It's just non -stop. I mean, it's so hard for people to realize this now, especially if anybody's younger and, like, didn't grow up with this. But this was, like, a game-changing game moment in horror to have this come out. And yeah. now everything is self-aware. Everything has the rules applied. But this is the movie that truly went full-on meta first. Like, this is this is it. Yeah, it sure did. And for y'all that don't know, sitting over oh, there yeah, right? is Hello. your hostess, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> I am your host, CJ. Uh, we love talking horror, and we are very excited to talk about this yes. one today. <laughs> uh, Screams brought to you by Wes Craven, um, one of the proper horror masters. Oh, Wes. So, well, I mean... Does anything need to be said about him? Other, you know, Scream, Nightmare on Elm Street, Hills Have Eyes, yeah. People on the Stairs. Enough said. Uh, this is such a fun movie because of how quick the writing is and how it gives you just everything that you want in a horror movie. And of course, uh, that, that great writing is coming from Kevin Williamson. I'll be honest, I don't know much about him, but I never watched Dawson's Creek, but there he is. Oh my so. God, how did you get through the 2000s without watching a single episode of Dawson's Creek? Sorry, okay, excuse how about, me. How about, I guess I just wasn't I know, that 2000. I know what you did last summer. I mean, that's also Kevin Williamson and also a classic. Okay. Okay, yep. at least we, we're yeah, there. Fair, okay, okay, yep, fair. For sure. Go, go see that one too. <laughs> yep. Uh, but... This is also cast heavy. Uh, help me walk mm. through this dense list. Of so cast. this is like one of those things where I just think it's funny because I can't tell if the cast feels so dense because that this is who I grew up with and who I know. And obviously some of these are really big names, but even the like mm. non big names in my head, I'm like, well, duh, like you should know who Ski Allrich is. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, so yeah. it's just really it's right. funny because I just can't tell if in my head it's really stacked or if it really <laughs> is really stacked. But regardless, we have our final girl. Of all final girls, Nev Campbell playing Sydney. Come on, guys. She, mm. I mean, she's oh. still killing it. Don't get me wrong. But classic 90s. You Gangsta. got the craft, wild things, party of five. And then on a similar, very, again, everybody here is very 90s to be fair, obviously. We've got Courtney Cox playing <laughs> Gil Weathers, who is obviously has one of the best arcs throughout the entire franchise. Love her so much. We've got Dewey, who is David Arquette, right? Um, yeah, who recently was in Bone Tomahawk to throw like a, a sweet horror movie in the mix that's really good and you should watch it. As I said, Ski Ulrich yeah. is playing Billy. I gotta, I, I gotta throw out the eight legged freaks. <laughs> I, I was a personal I favorite when it. I was a kid. <laughs> no, I dig it. I dig it. Um, yeah. Obviously, we've got that excellent <laughs> cameo at the beginning by Drew. Barry Morin. Again, she's rapping a little horror these days. She just uh, did Santa Clarita mm. Diet for anybody that watched that on Netflix. It's pretty fun. Um, Roger Jackson is the voice of Ghostface. He's been in every single scream. And guys, I don't know how I didn't know this. He was Mojo mm. Jojo from the Powerpuff Girls. So, okay. That was a moment. That was a moment <laughs> for me. I was There's a nice throwback for you. Speed through some of the rest of these. We got Rose McGowan playing Tatum, the best friend. We've got <sighs> Matthew Lillard with the most epic performance I've ever seen <laughs> playing Stu. Uh, Jamie Kennedy is playing Randy. Yes. Lee Schreiber has kind of more a cameo in this one, but if you know Scream, you know Cotton comes back up in it. 
Uh, come on, guys. Henley. Henry Winkler is pray he's playing the principal but here's the best bit he's like an uncredited role love he's it. uncredited in this i don't i forget was yeah, it there's really like a whole reason why and sadly i wish i could remember off the top of my head but i can't oh, i can't no. which is really bad let us know really bad and then we get some epic cameos in the form of linda blair playing a reporter and wes craven playing the uh janitor who's wearing the elm street sweater so yeah i love it there's so much horror That's in this great. movie even in the cameos yeah so uh, what really is brilliant about the movie of course we've already said it uh is is it's like self-criticism as a horror film so it's like kind of poking fun of itself as you're watching the movie but it's not the only thing that like makes this movie golden uh it has phenomenal acting the the screenwriting is phenomenal uh the direction is great the gore is great i I'm really going to struggle to find problems in this film. Uh, what are some of the <laughs> I, like, highlights my, I was that trying to think as you with? said that. I, I'm sure we'll get there, but to be honest, I, I'm going to struggle as well with this one. Biased opinion, obviously, but I grew up, I love this movie. It, it's still so enjoyable as like the first time I watched it. Like I, I get more out of this every yeah. single time. I just enjoy it so much. Like you said, the meta-ness was huge for the time and a huge aspect of why this is like still so relevant, but it also is just a really solid horror movie in itself. Like that opening scene, which we'll dive into obviously in the spoiler section. Yes. I think is genuinely like one of the scariest things. It, it is it is really, really scary, actually. It's pretty masterful. And yeah, like you said, like rewatching it, I was as yes. scared as I was previously. And and with new perspective as, you know, a parent and <gasps> oh. uh, just being older, like it is as terrifying and, and it's heartbreaking and the situation too is so intense. which is a really it hard is. it's brutal, brutal chord to brutal. like strike to be able to in an opening with a character you yeah. don't know that well to manage to like mm -hmm. be that scared for her and then like also really heartbroken at what transpires so that's again just that element of like great directing great writing great acting but then also mixing in the comedy because yes! right off the bat it's funny and it's also scary and suspenseful. And it, it really takes you on a roller coaster the whole movie. It just riding that line of funny uh, and, and and then scary and in graphic, but not like always in good taste, if you will. It is not gore for gore's sake always. No, and so, it didn't get uh, it, too meta at this point. Movie. Like it was very self-aware without being obnoxious. Yeah. And I think that's what we have a harder time seeing with newer films is it gets to the point of just being annoying when you have a character who's that self-aware. This is able to ride that line mm -hmm. so much cleaner and it and everyone still comes across as very likable but knowledgeable, which again, just good characters you actually root and care about then. Yeah, I would be really curious to hear like uh, a, a younger generation's oh perspective on <laughs> yeah. this film that that ha is probably more used to seeing meta type yeah. movies like this uh, with a lot of like self criticism. Um, so I I would love to hear what people think if it's like it feels like it's been there done that. But you got to remember that this is the OG. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, does it still hold water to y'all? Or does it feel kind of like a, something that's potentially hokey? I think it's brilliant. Um, something else that can't be understated is the the score. Oh God, and, it's and so music good. Choice in this film yeah, is absolutely great. Uh, you know, at times like I know in the beginning, there's like references to like Halloween and getting some of those like Halloween. There's a lot of John Carpenter references, kind of which I is pretty good. You know, I love it. So I was like, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we could sit here and talk about it yeah, all day, and that's what we're gonna get to. <laughs> but maybe for the spoiler-free section, we should cut to the chase. Yes. Taylor. Bottom line. Let's start with Monsters Under the Bed. How scary is this? Out of four Monsters Under the Bed, what's your rating? 
So, hmm, <laughs> in terms of scares, this is a hard one because I feel like it almost like the peak scare factor for me is actually at the beginning, but I legitimately find the beginning <laughs> terrifying. Right. <laughs> so it's. <sighs> yeah. That's a hard one. I think. And again, it's one of those things we kind of talked about with the thing where I've seen it so many times that it's really hard to like when you know when every jump scare is coming, when you know, like the big reveals, when you know everything that's going to go down in terms of gore, it's kind of hard to have the same gut feeling you had. Now, I do remember the first time I watched this being super scared and there's that chair that gets thrown at the beginning and it made me jump for the first like 10 years I watched this movie now it doesn't really do it as much um so I think with this one I think I'm gonna give it a two and a half and again I say this is a very very specifically noting I have just seen this too many times to like have an unbiased or clear opinion on it I know it's scary though, mm. so I do. I do want to bump it over the two, but I don't think I can give it the three because it isn't as impactful, obviously, on your hundredth viewing. So, even though I love it, I watch it every year. I watch it multiple times yeah. a year. But I mean, so what? I guess for you, what's what? How do you feel? You probably watched it a little less than me, so I'm curious. But you also know it really well, so... <laughs> Probably not a hundred times, but, you know, somewhere ab above ten. Uh, I would say, um... I'm gonna land at a three monsters under your bed out of four. Uh, that opening scene is doing a whole lot for Ooh, me. Yeah. Um, I think it's scary as anyone that's been home alone scary for women that have been home alone scary for adults leaving a child home alone uh i think that the rest of the movie is pretty good about building suspense at for moments sure. um not that it's like very suspenseful but then i also just love that kind of cat and mouse of like figuring out who is the killer uh so that's always kind of keeping you on your toes and can build suspense in moments that otherwise would not be suspenseful uh but um you know i think there are some sort of like mildly comedic moments with ghost face um while he is uh you know chasing people uh around town uh he can be a bit clumsy at times which sort of removes a little fear but you factor. have to because otherwise um, he would be like a jason-esque yeah. type killer unstoppable and that would be outrageous where exactly. obviously we know each movie this is a person at the end of the day like a real human person so i actually i mm -hmm. totally agree with you it does throw off some of the scare factor but also i feel like it's a very reasonable uh situation that a human's yeah. not and that it smooth is, it's also <laughs> yeah and it's also part of the critique right like horror is known for having bad monsters that just can't kill anybody you know and are slow <laughs> it's like the star wars conundrum there yeah. so it does <laughs> it does play on this a little bit but all right overall rating where are we taylor out of four stars i feel like a little bit of bias is gonna come into play with this like i'm not gonna bump it again man i'm really really hitting these halves but i never really thought i would do that i thought i could be more structure than that you're killing me taylor let's be I bold know. be assertive and Send i can't it. i can't like i just can't corn get over a fort but it's so damn close it's so close for me mm. that i have to what's holding it back Tell i me. will say well okay we have to wait to get to some of what doesn't quite right. work we'll get to um, it stick around for the spoiler session, yeah because that's where where i think some of it has aged maybe a little poorly and some of it maybe didn't work as well in the first place. But again, mm. that feels like such minuscule criticisms that I'm just like, beep, 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 beep. Um, I'm going to give it a, th I'm going to yep. give it a three and a half because I just think like in terms, maybe it's just the editing and the cinematography. I don't think it like was groundbreaking per se, but I am obsessed with the script. I'm obsessed with the soundtrack, with the acting, with the directing. So there is a lot to love about this movie a lot a lot to love but it's just like 
maybe not quite innovative or not quite scary enough for me to get to a four, but it is so very, very close. How about for you? Mm. I'm going to be bold. I'm going to be brave <laughs> and I'm going to give it a four. This, this is, this is a, an occasion where I will be generous and give it that four star rating. It, I think any it movie, has it, this lasted, deserves it. You're right. th withstood the test yes. of time. I know. I mean, we're talking about, you know, dang near 30 years old. We're and movie number six it is now. As yeah. funny. Yeah. I know, I know. To be able to build a franchise that's been like this lasting. Uh, I, I understand that, you know, typically I want to see something that's a little more innovative in, in edit and cinematography, but there is nothing wrong with going with mm -mm. a classic style, mm -mm. a classic approach. And I think this movie just triumphs in its writing and, and uh, tone and just overall concept. And rich characters, uh, rich-ish characters. But that's, this is Character the hard dynamics, part, too. It's rich. hard at this point. I don't know how you feel. I feel like it's hard to separate, let's say, like, the Gale from one to the Gale I know now. Like, it is hard for me to not put them together. Mm. And, like, and that's a benefit. That is absolutely, like, a bonus thing. That is not a detractor at all that's saying like there is such rich story right through all these movies with like the characters even if the movie is underwhelming the characters never are in my opinion or like our core characters never are is what i should say um right so sure. it's just like it's almost hard for me to separate because the things like i maybe didn't love about gail to begin with are things that you know, like then I come to love. I guess I slightly spoilered some of this, but if you guys don't know that she wasn't in more than one movie at this point, I don't really know what to tell you. It was in the nineties. Yeah. Like, can't figure it out. Right. But it it's like again, that's just <laughs> such a bonus though of of like watching characters. You see this in series, obviously, all the time, but it's so cool to watch this happen through a horror movie franchise because we also usually just get characters mm. axed off like in I'm, I'm not going to say that doesn't happen in the screen franchise but you get enough to keep you going and be really invested and excited about these characters and I think that's so fucking cool. I just love that. Absolutely. Uh very much agree with all of that. Um I think that pretty much sums up our spoiler-free section, y'all. If you're gonna hang around, you're gonna get spoilers. But, but get into all the good we stuff, pausing, though, guys. We're getting the movie into the good stuff. If you haven't, the best is yet to come, <laughs> and we got a gr interesting cocktail for y'all. Uh, and I think and then we like it. <laughs> our deep dive critique. So stick around. Welcome to the podcast under your bed. There'll be drinks, critique. And perhaps a few murders. You're all invited, but once the podcast has begun, there's no way out. The ghosts are waiting. So won't you join me for the podcast under your bed? <coughs> really fun and now all the kids in my house are wound the f up oh my god i had my volume like all the way on low and i still heard that <laughs> amazing all right I, I gotta shut this door amazing. hold on one second all right that was fun there's our final girls screams uh from my daughter and amazing her friends. <laughs> honestly i feel like that should that uh, should have probably just been it from the beginning i don't even know why we were even trying yeah any foley artists out there let me know i can send some uh recordings your way <laughs> <laughs> um okay we have some fun in store but first taylor Hit us with this drink. Yes. What in God's name am I drinking? Um, that is a great question. I've still, even though I made it, been asking myself that. So I think, first off, I think it's really fun <laughs> when anybody goes out of their way to make a drink tailored to a special horror film. You've made my life so much easier. So thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So this one is called The Stab. More. Yeah, more please. Um, this one is called The Stab. 
And it's from Creature Feature Presents. Now, the only thing is they're at, they are a TikTok account. However, it seems like they haven't been active for the last, like, month or two. So I don't really know if they're just taking a break or whatever. But I do recommend going to their page because they have a ton of horror-themed drinks, which is awesome. I'm sure we'll use them again moving forward because... This was such a bizarre cocktail, but I also really love the innovation here because I would never have put any of these yeah. elements together. <laughs> so, And although I do want to preface this, this drink is sweet, guys. Like I, I would highly recommend this be like kind of a one cocktail situation or cutting down on some of the sweeter elements because essentially like your base of your cocktail this, I mean, this should tell you everything. It begins with chocolate syrup. So that should tell you. And I would maybe lessen. Whoa. I would maybe lessen what's already. It's low, but it's still too much. Um, so it's chocolate syrup, black rum. You got butterscotch snaps, which I actually thought that combo was pretty fun. Um, Coca-Cola. Like, what? Yeah. And then as, like, a floater, because that's obviously a very dark base, it gives you the Why black not? of Ghostface, and then you get... For the floater and kind of the white of the mask, you get heavy whipping cream, simple syrup, and a pinch of salt, which actually was, like, really nice to balance some of that out. That said, again, this is very yeah. different, very sweet. I am enjoying drinking it, but I don't think I could have, like, <laughs> multiple of these per evening. Absolutely not. I do think the uh, the like whipped cream floater kind of helps balance totally. it out. It's almost like a, it's like a Sunday or like a, a rich root beer float. To be yeah, honest, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and you had um, a good suggestion, CJ, about maybe even cutting the simple syrup down a little bit to make it even like a little less sweet. And I think it would balance it even better. Yeah, yeah. I probably won't be drinking this again, I'll be honest, but it is fun to try and bust out in some random occasion where you're just trying to, you know, get well, crazy and have There you some go, a scream, a scream viewing menu. party. You have that as like the end of right. the night. Maybe when you get to the party scene, it's the, the last thing you drink and it's a fun little dessert type thing. But yeah, this is not. I might start with this. If I had this at the end of the night, I'd be <laughs> in the toilet what? for sure. You know what? You are entirely <laughs> correct. My stomach would be like, oh, I can't do this. You're entirely correct. Like <laughs> as we're filming this, I literally grabbed like the hoppiest IPA. I could be like, I've got to balance after this. <laughs> like a bit so i think i think you're right this is probably actually better suited maybe for the opening scene this is just better suited for the opening scene and then you can move on this might be a hit with college kids that's where i'll put it like you know high school college your kids, first time you know, drinking right, i'm not gonna yeah, your drinking. first time drinking <laughs> there you go <laughs> But uh, I probably would have drank this in college. Yes. Um, oh, God. We're just aging right. ourselves by the movie and by the drinks. This is not good. <sighs> but I get to just sit back and, yeah. and finish mine and move on to my IPA as you get to tell us all about Scream. And guys, remember, this is the spoiler summary. So if you are like myself and you know this movie like the back of your hand, Go ahead and skip forward. If you need a refresher, though, skip we're going to run through the whole movie. So here you go. All right. We open on high school student Casey receiving calls from an unknown person. The calls begin benign enough with discussions about horror movies, but turn super mm. creepy when Casey figures out the caller can nope. see her. The caller reveals he has kidnapped her boyfriend, Steve, and insists mm. that she play a horror trivia game to save their lives. A wrong answer will result in Steve's death via evisceration. Sorry, Steve. And, af <laughs> and after not answering the next question, Casey is attacked and brutally murdered by Ghostface, our villain. Despite her best efforts, Casey is killed and her parents discover her body in a very grotesque so sad. way. We are then introduced to the final girl of our generation, Sydney motherfucking yes. Prescott. Yes! Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> and we learn that her dad, Neil, is heading out of town and that her mother was murdered about a year ago. The next day at school is mayhem, with news reporters everywhere, including Gail Weathers. The two are not on the best of terms as she slams Sydney's credibility, stating that she identified the wrong man in her mother's mm. murder, Mr. Cotton Weary. 
Uh, while at school, we meet Sydney's friend group who discusses the crimes. This includes her boyfriend, Billy, her BFF, Tatum, and her boyfriend, Stu, and friend slash whore nerd, oh, Randy. Randy. Sydney returns home that afternoon and makes a plan to stay at Tatum's. While waiting for Tatum, Sydney receives a call from Ghostface, who eventually attacks her. Sydney is able to fight back and evade Ghostface long enough to contact 911, causing the killer to flee. Billy then enters Sydney's room and drops a cell phone, damning evidence for I him. mean, guys, it was the 90s. Causing her to Not accuse. a lot of people had cell phones, okay? That was like a big, like, dun, yeah. dun, dun, he has a phone yeah. thing. No, Taylor, not a cell phone, a cellular telephone. You're right, telephone. I'm sorry, a cellular telephone. And, uh, <laughs> and, of course, this causes her to accuse, uh, accuse Billy once uh, Dewey, the deputy, arrives, who is also Tatum's older brother. Billy is promptly arrested. That night, Sydney receives a call from Ghostface who states she fingered the wrong guy again. Ew. Anyone do it? I don't know. The next day at school is even more chaotic with a barrage of news vans, chatty peers, a lot of folks running around in Ghostface costumes. Sydney and Billy have an awkward talk resulting in Sydney running off and getting attacked by Ghostface. She escapes again and suspicion moves on to Neil, who can't be located. Of course, Sydney's father. A town curfew is enacted and school is canceled, prompting Stu to throw a party. With the students vacated, Principal Himbley is the next to die at the hands of Ghostface. While the girls are in town shopping for supplies, Dewey is informed the calls have been traced to Neil. Dewey takes the girls to the party and runs into Gail. The two flirt and Gail sets up a hidden camera before they leave to go check out a deserted car on the property. While grabbing beers in the garage, Tatum is attacked by Ghostface. She attempts to almost escape through the cat door, but is trapped, allowing Ghostface to send the door up, which breaks Tatum's neck in a super iconic It is death. so iconic, guys. A cat door? Death via cat door. No, it's a on. cat door. You have dog doors. That's a the cat door. dog the door. The cat goes cat. through the door. I'm calling it a cat door. The cat went through the door. There's no dog in sight. <laughs> Most of the guests leave <laughs> as Billy arrives, and Stu suggests he and Sydney head upstairs to talk. Mm. They reconcile and fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> that was very 90s of me. Meanwhile, the remaining partygoers are alerted that Principal Him Himbley's body is on display at the football yeah. field. The group disperses, leaving only Sydney, Billy, Stu, Randy, Kenny, Gail's cameraman, Gail and Dewey as her possible murderers, survivors, and victims. Cool. Gail and Dewey kiss after almost getting run over and discover the car that belongs to Neil. Sydney questions Billy about his arrest, and while talking, Ghostface appears and stabs him, then attacks Sydney, but she manages to make it to the news van where Kenny is. Kenny and Sydney watch the camera footage and see Randy about to get stabbed. A delay, however, means Randy is safe and that Kenny is the next victim, as Ghostface appears and slashes Sorry, his Kenny. throat. Dewey and Gail arrive at the seemingly abandoned home and split up, Dewey investigating further and Gail heading to the van looking for some assistance. Gail gets spooked by Randy and drives away. Gail's escape, however, is halted by Sydney's presence on the road and she mm. crashes. Sydney gets to the house to see Dewey, though alive, has been stabbed in the back. Sydney evades Ghostface and heads back to the house where both Stu and Randy profess their <laughs> innocence. Sydney, having none of this bullshit, <laughs> locks them both out of the house. Once inside, Billy, who is still alive, falls down the stairs. He takes Sydney's uh, recently acquired gun and unlocks the door, letting Randy in. Billy revealing himself to be a killer when he shoots Randy. Stu then enters and reveals himself to be the bow, 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 second bow, killer. Two killers. <laughs> we then get the master reveal. Sydney's mom and Billy's dad were banging, causing his mother to leave. Billy and Stu state they are going to frame Neil for the murders and kill him, making it look like a mass murder-suicide. The two plan to be the sole survivors left for dead and seal the ruse by stabbing each other several times, with Billy really going for Found it. a little boozy! <laughs> 
<laughs> Gal comes to Sydney's aid, but is knocked out. The distraction allows Sydney to escape and eventually knock Billy out. Stu then attacks Sydney, but she prevails and drops a TV on his motherfucking head, killing him. Billy manages to wake up and attack Sydney, but Gail shoots him. Randy awakens and notes the ending of any horror movie includes the last jump scare from the killer. Billy obliges, but is immediately <laughs> shot and killed by it. Sydney. Not in my That's movie. Right. Sydney, Neil, Gail, Dewey, and Randy survive for another sequel, and we end on Gail reporting about the events that just transpired. Which, like, by the way, how bad it <sighs> ass is it that you, like, got attacked and almost murdered, and you're like, I can still do my job. You're so I can still do my job. traumatized and riddled with adrenaline, and just spruce yourself up with a little she hair and makeup great. action. She looked great. And report She was the delivering news. it, too. Like, I was like, she's mm. really set in the scene, and I'm buying it, so... I'm here for Gail Weathers' report. Yeah. Maybe a little shaking with the <laughs> mic, but she got it. Uh, man, if if that doesn't like give you the sense of how like dense this plot is, uh, my rereading of it. I mean, it is quick. It moves fast, and the story just goes, 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 and you're just always you're even when you have your suspicions and you know you're probably right you still can't be certain that you know who the killer is who oh, is there's Ghostface, always right? plausible deniability um, from like every character like so you think for sure yeah obviously billy looks really guilty he pops in with a cellular telephone which is unheard of in the 90s <laughs> um so you're like oh yeah he's creepy and weird and being really off-putting that seems like this guy could be the killer but then Ghostface calls from jail and you're like or call he calls while billy's in jail and you're like oh no it couldn't be him or there's always a reason to think it isn't somebody and obviously on first viewing i don't think many of us would have known there were going to be two killers and it makes everything fit yeah logistically so much better where you're if this was one person i don't think you could have sold that absolutely uh there's a lot to get <sighs> God, to I but i think this movie deserves to start at the beginning um, this is the opening scene to like end all opening scenes to a horror flicks and slasher flicks. Where do you, uh, in a way, like, does it get any better? No, it doesn't. And I can't preface this enough at the time how much they pulled a psycho with this. And I know we all know this by now, but if you happen to be somebody that doesn't know the movie really well or didn't know the dynamics in the 90s, like, Drew Barrymore was the star billing of this film. Like in all the promo right. stuff, yeah. everyone thought she's going to be the final girl for sure. She's the biggest name on the bill. That makes sense. So to first off, like start off with her getting killed, I think is already just such a ballsy move and so smart. So, right. so, so smart. But then to top it off, it is like just some of the best tension that I have like ever seen in an opening of a horror film. Yes, 100% agree. It just sets your expectation that anything yes. goes. Anyone yes. can die. You cannot anticipate what's going to happen next. Um, and you're right about the tension. You know, starting off with that sort of like fun, well, flirty mildly yeah. flirty yeah. phone call. Yeah, and then immediately turning to, uh, wait, I'm on the phone with a psychopath that it's potentially could kill it's me. It's like the delivery, is, though, yeah. of, that, of that line where he, and it's so, he says it so nonchalantly, like, I want to know who I'm looking at. And she's like, what? Mm. Like, her immediate dropping mm -hmm. of her face and, like, what did you say? And he's like, I want to know who I'm talking to. And she's like, that that is not what you said. And that... Ooh, I got like a little chill as, <laughs> like, as I'm explaining it. <laughs> but I also have to say, I rewatched this specifically for the podcast, right? Um, 
and actually weirdly watched mm. it a couple days before just for fun and then <laughs> figured out we were going to do this. So I rewatched <laughs> it like a day before my family left and I was the only one in the in the house for the weekend. Oh, and I was like, this was mistake. such a mistake. Um, so I felt extra heightened just knowing like I was going to be on my own the next couple days. But that is just <laughs> such good acting and I also what I like about her in this opening too is just that she feels of like a very real fleshed out person she's not making stupid decisions she's getting appropriately freaked out when things are going on like hanging up the phone is a very Mm -hmm. like instinctual reaction and then having somebody say if you hang up I'm gonna gut you like a fish is like literally like the scariest thing (laughs) like I can't even imagine and she just sells every mm-hmm. moment of it, though. She's so good. Yes, totally agree. And, you know, the first death on camera is very iconic. The boyfriend's guts getting slashed open. Sorry, Steve. Uh, I mean, that Sorry, was one of the first, Steve. like, really violent things I saw in yeah, a movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, really sticks out to me as a 90s baby. Uh, it, and you know something else also is it's uh on it right off the bat is revealing some of the like just fun kind of camera and and atmospheric uh stuff they're doing to develop well to build this atmosphere and this quality um you know i like it when uh there's like practical effects that are driven by story and um aren't like outlandish and just there because they can do it so like she's you know because of this phone call she burns the popcorn and and now we have this like smoky atmosphere which that by the way those makes were also like, huge in the 90s feel. those popcorn packs like i feel like that's not as much the stove top the packs. 90s of this i know film. i feel like that should be a thing oh, though still I, I don't know why that's not as big as it was it is a thing but every big, time i go camping big. i buy yeah. one to bring along okay maybe yeah i don't know if they get like that like three foot <laughs> diameter or whatever no i but, think that's logistically a little um, ridiculous but yeah but then you also get like the fun camera play where they really played a lot with these like long camera takes uh you know not excessively long not like an entire scene but they really did let the camera float around and follow you your the characters through the scene and they really like the use of canted shots throughout the movie, but they aren't, you know, going like 90 degrees on anything. No, it's, it's very nothing natural feeling on, for for almost an unnatural situation in a way, but I think it does keep it very grounded because yeah. I think you're right. If it was getting very elaborate, I think it would detract from the tension that's being built. Or I think you're right. It just flows Absolutely. with her and follows her and it gives you like a much more isolated scary feeling versus if we're like trying to get really innovative with the shots and i i think you're totally right with that right right uh and you know if if you haven't seen this scene you've seen it duplicated or 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 made fun of parodied in some other way right scary like movie. scary movies the I mean, obvious scary one but, like almost but a direct then, of course it, like parody it's, you know? it's like the whole movie is, parody, is, yeah. is scary but i mean it just goes on and on like how many how many horror scenes kind of replicate this scene and and countless other scenes even the, the new um, one but i think the newest one and again i'll just slight spoiler not big spoiler if you haven't listened to the it was like one of our first episodes, so maybe you don't want to listen to it. We were, we were finding mm-hmm. your footing. But um, that opening scene is obviously yeah, super sure. reminiscent of this one with a, a very different and updated uh, perspective. But I think, like, as a Scream fan, I was kind of overjoyed to watch the, this scene play out in a more modern way. But it doesn't back. still doesn't have, yeah. like, it does not have the emotional weight or even, like, as it's still scary, but I don't think it quite has the scare factor of this scene. There's just something that's done in this scene that feels like you can't replicate it. Yeah, maybe it's a nostalgia quality, but there's also something interesting about the like older films where that 
there's a little more visceral yeah. feel to like the graininess and and the grit of the camera and the film stock of the time that sort of lends itself to I don't know a, a scary movie. I you know a digital to me just um, and, you know I gotta double check this and maybe this was shot digitally but uh, probably was no actually. I don't think so because uh, I think one of the first the, the look of it big studio digital films actually is 28 days later which is pre which is post date of this because that's the early well, 2000s that was on dv oh shoot you're right which you're right might be the slight you're difference right, you're there right, you're right. uh yeah Dol dolby digital so it is shot digital but um you know i i think there's but also the quality of the lenses for example like they're using uh <clears throat> you know the anamorphic lenses f for that beautiful 2.4 widescreen look but the lenses of the time like were pretty like distorted on the edges so you kind of get these like weird like almost like elongated like people are stretched tall and skinny and so as they're like canting the camera it's like extra distorting and it's just something about the quality of the time that the, the quality of the lenses even like just builds this the atmosphere that is extra heightened and suspenseful in it's my just, opinion it's just it's honestly it all just kind of it's worked. all like a master class to me like in making a great scene like this entire sequence is just so good and i mean you automatically yeah. get the you automatically get the horror trivia element in, which is so much fun. And so, again, very meta and very, like, aware of what horror is. And you get people in the audience, right. like, yelling at that point, being like, Jason wasn't the killer in the first place, which is, like, I think that's so yeah. smart. You fucking It's idiot. so smart, but also, like... Anybody who maybe isn't like a super weirdo like us might be like, yeah, Jason, of course, Jason's the killer in the, in the Friday the 13th <laughs> yeah, Jason, franchise because yeah. he is. But he just is he right. the ghost face is correct. He's not around until the second one. But I think that's super yeah. fun. And then honestly, I think the thing that sells that scene aside from it just being genuinely like super scary, like the phone call. The voice, okay, there, sorry, there's so much to this scene that makes it good. The voice, the <laughs> voice acting from uh, Ghostface is really scary because it, it does start off so, so relaxed and again, kind of flirty and it gets really scary very quickly. And he does an excellent job of building that, like, that feel, like if I heard that on the phone, I would start crying probably like Casey and probably try to hide in a corner. Um but even you know a little reminiscent of black christmas yes! right of that like voice on the phone that kind of like switches character suddenly and becomes hyper violent all of a sudden but you almost feel like it's in his nature and what he was doing prior is like the fake out mm. and that's what's like kind of the flip almost yes. of black christmas um so that part is really is really good the obviously like her acting into that it just sells everything. But for me, the thing that really like makes it terrifying and also like just heart wrenching is the parent factor. I think that is what makes this scene kind of go so next brutal. level to have the parents pick yeah. up the phone and to hear her on the line. And, and it is and she's in yep. such a bad way at that point. Like she's obviously she's probably already dying yeah. at that point, but it's just, just kind of gasping it's for so area heart-wrenching and to like have her windpipe kind of crushed so she can't really talk and all she can say is like mom and you're like oh your heart just breaks in a way it is like devastating it mm. is really upsetting to watch yeah big time and then the final reveal of her <laughs> hanging in the tree <sighs> is like uh, if it wasn't bad then it's yes. bad um, and the parents acting and i do want to say parents you know, acting very good Oh, absolutely. Uh, the phone call, I think, is an interesting segue to sort of uh, Billy and Stu's kind of motivation oh my God, to let's get into murder. <laughs> yeah. They're a whole I mean, conversation, this is a solid to be conversation. fair. They are, it, and yeah. they're almost like separate entities in my mind in terms of like their ghost face and their motivations. They're kind of like. Yes. very different diverging uh, paths here like what i think is kind of funny in a way is that i almost feel like 
Billy is so much more of a bitch in like <laughs> in terms of like now we're like really dude like y- he's he is aged yeah, like, kind of like poorly petty bitch, like you couldn't handle it <laughs> i'm like okay seriously oh, of- like to all of his character to be like y- so yeah 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 i mean sydney points it out which i think is great that she's like are you kidding me kind of a thing like you're a big mama's boy and i'm like girl a hundred percent um but like he's so uh-huh. he is he's the worst though his motivation is is definitely like a little bit more linear where you can get track and understand it Stu though there's something i deeply love about Stu. but before i get on a rant i want to hear your thoughts about the two of them their motivations who you maybe think is the stronger killer is stronger ghost face i'm just curious oh man um you know, I love the idea of uh, they say at the end of the film in the final scene, right? Like, you know, it's so much scarier when there is no motivation, <laughs> yeah, um, which yeah. I think is great. And what and, and it's kind of like what lends Stu's character to like, like what l- brought him to this point? That is really fucked up. Like, it is like a critique of the yeah. times. Like, I have kids like gone off the deep end and exposure and being up. Uh, you know, the principal says like, uh uh desensitized to to the violence around them in the world but um (laughs) you know so whereas like while billy like clearly is off the deep end like uh, at least there is like a motivation motivation that drives him yeah so so in a way becomes a little more tangible and less scary uh i you know i don't remember what year the columbine shooting was but i see this and just see like these really straight parallels in a very disturbing way of like the conversations they're having and the like calculation that these high school students have and what they're doing is extremely scary and extremely disturbing Um, so three years after i just did a fact check it was 99 though because i thought it was close to 2000 but I, but I want to say I fully Columbine came three yeah, years but I later. Fully, I fully see and totally agree with your uh, connection there. So, I mean, what the hell is the line in this movie like about? It Movies just, don't like, make sense. No, they just like, like make them more to... innovative or whatever it is. You yeah, know, it's like exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Like that. That is like ballsy as a filmmaker to overtly say and take claim of especially when a few years later there's shit but like it's that a happening. great you know, critique like, though like, because that was the whole thing and now we know Mar- marilyn manson sucks so we don't or it, we know that now but at the time that that happened it literally was the that was the thing they were like oh it was marilyn manson music it was these songs it was blah 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 so it's it's kind of interesting to have like that kind of quote occur prior to saying like you can't blame the movies or you can't blame media for these people yeah, being can't sick blame puppies Marilyn Manson. like yeah. you know because those i don't think you can but that was the whole argument in the 90s is no. that like this kind of content was gonna create some kind of psychopath and it's like come on man seriously yeah or or for some out there was the video game postal going postal uh Oh man, I mean that was one of the OG like, about, um, like prior to Grand Theft I, Auto of, yeah. and stuff where it, it it uh you know that was one of the OG like shoot 'em up type games where you could And <laughs> just that's gonna somehow you know, so though it really is coming out of a crazy time. Whatever. I mean it's so stupid. So I actually love that they make that critique that early before that argument mm-hmm. even I mean, that argument's been exi- that argument is the same argument that was used against like porn. But like, it's just really oh it's God, interesting how that like then like the evolution of that is then. Well, OK, it's not it's not the sexual side. Now it's the horror side of things. And it just people always want to look for some kind of media blamage. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I got so off, we I got love, off topic on that one, but <laughs> no, no, I know, I know, I know. I love the, but that's like the purpose of the movie. Um, I love that uh, the the two characters, Stu and Billy, also come to this like collision at the end, where you know there's this like weird power yes. dynamic where 
Billy's like, give me the knife. Like he wants, you know, they're like, is one of them gonna screw the other one over? And kind of does, you know, Billy like is in this place where he like just finally gets his aggression out, takes it out on Stu. But Stu also and hits him really hard first, which is where I think, like, Stu is trying to take the power dynamic to begin with. Like, obviously, Billy is the mastermind, mm. but then Sydney kind of points that out, and then Stu gets this kind of, like, masculine, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a part of this, and so <laughs> I'm going to stab Billy really hard, and then Billy's like, oh, no, you yeah. did not. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> like, I'm in charge kind of a thing. It is yeah. It's really like masculine who's the mastermind kind of a thing going on yeah yeah Stu really does kind of come off as like sort of the village idiot <laughs> that gets know, roped into I know, it right but i but, love him in some weird way oh i mean he's a brilliant character and it's really brought to life by the acting at the end of the day can I mean, we talk oh about God. that for a minute it literally to me is a performance that should work on no level because it is so stupidly unhinged. Even when he's being normal, quote unquote, it is an unhinged performance from Matthew Lillard that I buy yeah. every second of and I completely love. And it, again, that should not work. If I saw that in another horror movie, I would be like, oh my God, that's ridiculous. But in this yeah. I don't know. The stars aligned. He delivered everything so outrageously that I just, again, I eat it all up. I mean, I don't know why it works, but it does. I, I think part of it is that he's still as unhinged up to the very <laughs> end. You know, he's like, he's as funny and, and like desperate for well, like yeah. being funny and affectionate at, all the way to the end. Um, you know, a great moment earlier than the final scene is um the scene in the blockbuster movie store which super loved 90s loved everything you for the about that even the movie recommendations <laughs> and everything like loved it oh yeah 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 so you know of course it gets super meta there talking about you know Oh, the, the dad being the red herring horror. and Billy being the actual killer. Yeah. Like, Randy, everyone should listen to yeah. Randy. Dad's going to show up in the last yeah. reel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so love how it all kind of comes out there. But you, it's also the first time you really get Billy and Stu, like, revealing themselves in this tag team, a, a duo in a creepy totally. way. When when they uh, are, are kind of fucking with, uh, with Randy. Um, and you know, you, you can kind of miss it on the first viewing, kind of finding some creepy elements to it. But then, you know, obviously in rewatch, you're like, wow, it's really dark what they're doing and kind of toying with everybody around them <laughs> and references all the way up to the very first time they're introduced as characters talking about maybe you're the killer. Oh, maybe you're the killer. But like, again, it's, Randy it's just really spot fun. on nailed it the entire way of telling him exactly what was going on. Now he didn't pin, he didn't yeah. pin Stu. You're telling me Billy doesn't have killer rain <laughs> all over him? <laughs> but he's right. No, he's Leather faces when he calls him too, which I think is just like so great. Um, he's just, I love, I love having Randy because he is every horror movie nerd. Like that is the embodiment of it. And I mean, like, okay, he's a little callous at the beginning, like with the whole liver jokes. And mm -hmm. you're like, oh, okay, that feels like a little, no, <laughs> like that feels a little gauche to be fair. But I love, I thought Stu made the liver joke well Wasn't he says did they find her liver in the mailbox i heard they find her liver in the mailbox and then he's like liver alone is the mm. next like i maybe <laughs> watched it once or twice i don't know <laughs> but i love um i love that it's like you as a audience member have like somebody vocalizing exactly what you think. And it's just really, mm -hmm. again, a part of that really fun meta aspect of it to, to have the embodiment of you on screen and, and saying all of the things that you're thinking in your head out loud. And I, I mean like now we get a thousand Randy's, but he was the original and we got to love him. Yeah. A hundred. Uh, let's talk about the iconicness of Ghostface. Oh my God. Um, yes. 
like outside of I don't know Jason's mask is is it the most iconic I think you're forgetting somebody mask? Michael Myers thank you you, got, you can't come on now yeah. um, I mean those are the three though. oh yeah like end of story well, and then yeah. like i think uh closely to that would you'd get to Leatherface, and you get chucky which isn't quite a mask yeah, but you know but those are your chucky but these are our horror icons these are our horror icons you're like yeah. yeah there's jason there's michael there's Ghostface, there's chucky there's Leatherface. like that it, there's me no maybe two degree pinhead but like it is so. It, mm. Here's what I love, though, that separates Ghostface from the pact in a way is that, like, so Michael and Jason and Chucky and Pinhead are all the same person. They're all the same being. What I love that they did in Scream mm. that is so different is that, and you can't do this in other movies as we've seen. Again, slight spoilers. Yeah. I'm going to slight spoilers for both Friday the 13th and, and Halloween. So if you. Skip yep. the next like yep. 30 seconds yep. if you don't want to uh, hear that. We've seen people try to pick up the mask, though, and the audience reception is yep. just awful. <laughs> it's Shit. horrible. But yep. what they wisely yep. did in this franchise was set it up so that we expect it to be a different person every time. If it was the same person, something mm -hmm. wrong would have happened. And so they can, in theory, yeah. continue this as long as they want. And I just think that it's so different. Who else is doing that? Yeah, I absolutely love it. It's it's the film nerd, the like film junkie that dons the mask and carries it forward. Like you need a reboot, you need a requel, you need a sequel. Uh, I mean, it's absolutely fantastic that uh, that's the the choice they made, and you know the critique they're making on on the genre because. You know, it's a way of almost like mirroring like the directors, like, you know, it's the next director that's picking up the torch and like making the next movie. <laughs> oh, a hundred, a hundred percent. And again, they've just set themselves up where other franchises have pigeonholed themselves by being like, we want Michael to be Michael Myers. We don't want it to be somebody else. We want Jason to be Jason Voorhees. We don't want it to be somebody else. But Ghostface... We want it to be somebody else. We're excited. We're looking for who it is. We're trying to solve the puzzle. <laughs> like, who, who is the ghost face? Has every ghost face been amazing? No. <laughs> we can all say that. But <laughs> when they hit it right, it's flawless. <laughs> like, this first movie, again, especially, having two people end up being ghost face was just... I, again, I think like now we've seen it a hundred times. You say, yeah, of course, but of course it was two people and it's actually been two people quite a lot of times at this point, but yeah, it's yeah. fucking awesome. <laughs> they did this no, and no brilliant. one was expecting it at the yeah. time. Yeah, exactly. At the time, what other movies had two killers? I can't really think of not any, many. To be honest. Not like, a small proper, list. Like, like slasher yeah um you know unless it was like you know uh, like some sort of like duo that was killing people together that you were sure like of. a body um, and clyde like we're expecting uh, it's obviously yeah, <laughs> that's already it's there. Kinda, yeah yeah not that it's a horror no. yeah but um perhaps real life so, horror but yeah <laughs> all right to <laughs> that's true to to change subjects a bit Sydney as Final Girl. Come on, Sydney. Thoughts. Come on, Sydney is the best. And what? Better, better ask. What makes her so damn iconic? I think like a huge part of what makes her so great is her adaptability, and that again kind of goes through all the films and the different like stages she goes through. And again, I'll give a a mild spoiler like yeah. i don't think i'm ruining this too much but if you're if you've not seen the scream franchise again skip forward like a minute here but her going from young and naive then going to i'm just trying to live my life then you move into the phase of kind of this like trauma um 
like that this is really fucked up her whole life after two movies then mm-hmm. you move into her trying mm-hmm. to take the power back and then in the fifth one she is like a fully fledged in control individual which again just like that just breaks my fucking heart to think she's not going to be in this next one like i feel like i if it were not for the fact that courtney cox was in this next one i don't even know how i'd feel about it i'd be so upset because i just can't <laughs> i can't think of scream without sydney like she is she is our final girl she's resourceful she is empathetic she's somebody who's very likable she makes smart decisions but also like reasonably stupid decisions at times like not going for the latch the eighth time in the first movie and running upstairs instead which is the exact thing she said to not do but she's just so Mm. relatable and again her kind of going through all the stages of like what it might be to be a final girl, I think just makes her like transcend kind of almost any other final girl. I guess like what's your view on Sydney and her as this iconic status? No, it's a hundred percent. It is, is that she is a strong independent character, you know, someone that has this history of trauma and, um, has, has learned to cope with it and live with it and shows resilience Um, and while she still is vulnerable, very vulnerable in lots of ways, physically, emotionally, uh, that she still fights and, and has it within her to do what's necessary to survive. Um, and even, you know, and while she has a history with Billy also not like being this dumb ditz that just, you know, wants his cock, right? (laughs) Like that is like very suspicious of him even when you know police and others are suggesting that he's not suspicious like still on her guard and and trying to navigate the the territories and then also like i do like how scream flips the script on you know a lot of these horror tropes of you know, she loses her virginity. Thank you for pointing uh, that out. Yes. She is a high school character that, you know, still gets seduced into this moment. Um, but she survives, right? And then also, uh, oh, why am I fucking blinking? Not do the... Uh, Rand? Uh, fucking Randy, um, right? He drinks and partakes. Oh in yeah, they all do some sinful yeah. activities, and he still and survives. And he even right. points so, out that you're so, not supposed uh, to do any illicit activities, right. and he still does yeah. it too. Yeah. So while screams like laying these as the rules, right? It's they, transcending they, it too. They, yeah. They yeah transcend it and, and flip it on its head. That hey. We are a horror film, but we're still going to surprise you. And and, modernize it, because I think now, which is a really awesome Mm. thing, is that we're not seeing our final girls be virginal anymore, which was definitely like the set standard Mm. for a long time. It's really nice to see that trope go out the window. And like, you know, even like... I could think of a million movies at this point, actually, where the final girl drinks or smokes or has sex or is, you know, mouthy or whatever. Like, it's nice that we're not just getting and don't I'm not shading (laughs) at all. Jamie Lee Curtis's character. Obviously not. I love Laurie Strode. But like Laurie was very much that representation of the she's the virginal babysitter who's not parting. And now it's like, yeah, you could be a lot more complicated than that. And you can be a fully fleshed out person and still be the final girl. And that's what I think scream really did, which is. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Um, now do we like the, like, I, I guess I want to talk about Scream as a franchise. Oh, sure. oh yeah, right? let's uh, do it. <laughs> it. It laid such a legacy down. And I know we sort of discussed this in the last uh, episode when, with, with the, the requel that came out um, one, two years ago. And uh, so your thoughts on what, like, how did Scream lay a foundation for, for horror films to come and the franchise ahead? I mean, it definitely 
there's no doubt this first one had such an impact on horror to the point where we were almost getting saturated with just these ridiculous meta things that couldn't carry the same like weight that this film did, um, which is very like obnoxious. And we still see some of that happening today. I think like it cooled down a little bit um, in terms of being so self-aware that it was ridiculous. But I'll say like as an entire franchise, even the, so, like, OK, I am not I don't know how much this is going to like resonate with you or not. Like, maybe this is the point where I lose people. But the second and the third are not my favorite movies or they weren't, I should say. Yeah. Going back and rewatching them, though, I cannot believe how much more merit they had than I even than I remembered, because I think especially the third one is such a low point in the franchise that I had kind of written it off and really like not I've made it like intentionally not rewatched it. So when I went back and rewatched it last year, I wanted to watch all the movies in order before the new one came out, because obviously that was like a very big event. I couldn't believe yeah. how much I enjoyed it. And I and that was the weak point for me and how much I still enjoyed it. The killer reveal still two hard thumbs down for me. Like I fucking hate the killer <laughs> reveal in a big way. <laughs> Nothing is going to change my mind about that. But everything that went around that, the characters that were brought in, the storyline that was kind of brought in, I just it's so I just think Scream is so much fun and even when it's bad, it can still be so good. And I don't think you can say that about yeah. a lot of franchises. I genuinely believe, again, even with its low points, this might be one of the strongest horror franchises we've seen. The re- the requel came in very hard in a good way. Being a little more uh, less indoctrinated in the franchise, how do you feel? And also, where do you kind of feel like this melds in with the horror echelon as it were this just will always stand as one of the the og slashers for me um i i think it's really phenomenal that it can be so iconic and meta like the fact that it's able to accomplish both is kind of mind blowing that it still goes down as a great slasher, regardless of it being funny and and self-critical of the genre. Um, I just don't know where that exists outside of this film. It's not an easy feat to accomplish. It's, uh, you know, Wes Craven obviously has done amazing things. All right. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, but uh, it's iconic. And if you haven't seen it, shame. well, the heart, the heart <laughs> is you. there. And I think that's the I think that's actually with the self-awareness. What sets it apart is it can feel so mean spirited in other movies or make you feel like you're as an audience stupid. And I think making fun yeah, of instead of being like, a part of the joke, like yeah. making fun of yourself. There's It's like the difference of like self-deprecating humor versus like like ridiculing someone uh, right it's almost 100%. the difference of that a hundred percent so i think that's what really separates it from the pack and i think i think the last at least for me the last two points where i'm like we, we got to touch on this is the the infamous yeah. i think like party scenes reveals in in actually every scream film because that's yeah, insane yeah, and we have yeah, to yeah. touch on the effects and best deaths here so i think let's wrap it up with the Mm. end so before we get to the end bit let's talk obviously about best deaths and effects in this film which i personally feel like are just they're just kind of flawlessly done where it feels like the time and attention were really paid to it but they never feel ridiculous in this first one i think like Obviously, each movie and we as an audience expect more and more gore as we're moving forward. So obviously the new one, significantly more gore because duh, that's what we want as an audience. But especially for the 90s, I thought. Give it to me. I thought like exceptionally well done. Yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, it's not 
not gory. No. <laughs> I mean, Jesus it is violent. It's There's fuck. an evisceration. Um, yeah, <laughs> the, it's like at the first. Yeah. Get, yeah. Exactly. I mean, towards the end, it's more just like blood on the shirt. Right. Or like. A but does it not feel real, wound. like the stabbing it's, bit, especially? Does that not feel like very visceral? No, hundred percent, it feels very real. I mean, the only time where I was like, "Wow, the effects are kind of like lacking here. Why doesn't that look real?" was when Billy got stabbed a bunch of times, and it was, "Hey, hello." He didn't actually; it was faked, right? <laughs> so uh, when the first time he gets, he gets stabbed, fake stabbed, um, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's exactly it's intentional. So I thought it was brilliant, and you can see the the difference right oh, yeah. uh, in the quality of the blood on his shirt and his acting um, as well which actually know, like good comment on the acting right it got a little over dramatic the first you know time, and you're yeah. like oh wow he just yeah he just kind of died that oh, way oh, so oh, the Sydney. subtle quality yeah. <laughs> shift exactly is is very great um and again kind of that making fun of how bad horror film deaths occur is is hysterical oh, you're that so he gets right. to do Because when he actually ah. gets stabbed, he's like, fuck, you know, it's a very different, like, <laughs> it's a very different yeah, reaction yeah. versus the, the fake out dramatized, I'm reaching my hand out and I'm falling kind of a thing. Right. You're totally right. All right. So best death. Oh, we, we have to agree, <sighs> right? O opening death it's such a tough one that technically the second drew barrymore okay i struggle with this one a little bit only because the first one is so iconic and that the setup is so incredible mm -hmm. and the reveal is so incredible mm -hmm. however i would feel like we didn't do this movie justice if we didn't talk about almost the audacity of tatum's death but also i have to say I just have to say, I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> defend her on this one. The, she is a tiny, tiny little gal, people. Rose McGowan is short and small. <laughs> now, someone like myself would never attempt to fit through a dog door. However, I, I genuinely <laughs> believe if anyone was going to do it and get through that, Rose McGowan is probably the closest person I can uh, think of. And also, I just have to say, well, where else was she going to go? OK, there was no other way to yeah, go. Fair. I I got a couple of thoughts <laughs> on that. That death. Uh, one one is got probably more than a couple. But yeah. one is that um, I have never owned a garage door that will open up if no, there's more than no, a pound of pressure no, it won't. It <laughs> so won't. somehow that garage door <laughs> lifted her up you right, are correct suspending my disbelief suspended. yes please uh i think it's absolutely fantastic and i i love that it like in the scene prior to that they're like oh the obligatory like tits uh like scene and and they're like uh you know, and then you get this like super busty chick bust through the door, like nipples bursting <laughs> out of the shirt. Like it's just funny. Like I, I literally laughed out loud watching it. Um, and then uh, uh, even before that, I forget which character said. I want to say was Sydney was like, oh, I don't watch those. It's just dumb busty it's babes a big dying or something. Bimbo you know, and running upstairs. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. this was. This was that moment in the movie. They had to have the big breasted bimbo die in kind of a funny way. And so, of course, she like wiggles through this little door and kind of gets stuck with her hips and her tits, not letting her through. So, but also, I think I, you I like think it's Tatum. Iconic and hysterical. Which, again, just kind of takes it next level. Yeah. Which it just takes it to the next level because, yes. She would be considered like the dumb, blonde, big boobed, whatever. But I actually think Tatum mm -hmm. is someone you care about. But like a good yeah. friend, supportive friend, not making bad decisions. Sure, she went on her own to get the beer, but, but like also, she's trying Stu to be sent her do her doom in that one. And she literally even says, like, what am I, the beer wench? And then she's got some of the best lines yeah, exactly. in that scene, too, of being like, I want to be in the sequel. Like, she's She's just so, I love Tatum. Yeah. She's salty to the end. That, that is 
a like, great moment. Like, she's getting attacked by ghosts. Yes. She throws beers at him. She delivers salty lines. Yeah. Like, I think she's just kind of the next level of, like, the big idiot character, like, the big dumb boobed yeah. girl. But, like, she is someone that you're like, I love her. Like, and it was disappointing to see her die. But I'm so glad she got, like, one of the yeah. most iconic deaths of the, <laughs> of the film. Because, like, who else died by via garage door? Come on, guys. Like, that is next I, level. I can't name one. I cannot. <laughs> um, I'll be honest. One of the characters I was most sad to see go was uh, Principal Author. Oh, my <laughs> Arthur. God. I, mean, <laughs> I know. Actually, because he's uh, really empathetic and caring. And not only is he like. Yeah. Obviously, at that time, the Fonz was, I think, what we all knew him by. Now, I think Barry is like our go to mm. or Arrested Development. Like Barry Zucker Corn. Come on. He's amazing. Yeah. But like, I think that's would, what yeah. we would go to to now. But it's like really amazing <laughs> that he opted to do this movie and not I think a part of if I'm remembering correctly and I apologize to our <laughs> listeners if I have this wrong but I swear a part of him not taking the billing was that he didn't want it to detract being like he's the Fonz you know what I mean because I think a lot of people didn't mm. know him looking like a bit older so mm. I swear that was part of it I could be wrong could be misremembering but his yeah, he's a really he's really actually very empathetic and caring character. He wants to protect Sydney. He thinks it's disgusting that people are making like jokes about these two poor high school students who were murdered. Like he's actually yeah. a really nice guy. Yeah. So him dying and then getting like strung up just feels like an extra like fuck you that you're like, oh, no, he didn't deserve that. I totally agree with you. Yeah, I hear it. Uh, last wrap up moment. And just the end, I think. And also, sorry, I don't know how we didn't really get to this, but doing Gail, amazing. I think we can fully, we will, I'm sure oh that's going to pop up in the next one. Having again, spoiler if you're, but come on, guys, really, uh, <laughs> is I'm excited to see yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of Gail at the forefront and what this looks like. I'm really stoked. She is such a, an amazing character. I'm really looking forward to seeing where she goes kind of being, I hope, in the forefront. Because quite honestly, like for us 90s babies, mm. we're like, that's who I resonate with more than the new cast. So my fingers are crossed that she has a good part. And if they kill her, I will literally set fire to something. I don't know what, but it will happen. I will <laughs> kill someone. <laughs> right in the streets. Um, so I think, yeah, as our as our. Uh, ending big topic and sorry we've already talked a lot but this is just a movie that it just deserves all the attention it gets but deserves. I it. think it's just kind of touching on the how kind of wild this is that and now this is kind of a cornerstone in any of these uh, screen movies is that we literally spend a solid I would say varying movies but 40 minutes to an hour is the climax in the ending, which is wild <laughs> because I think in most movies, right. your resolution and stuff is going to be like climax and resolution is going to be like, I don't know, 20 minutes. But Scream has built itself as getting to this big party reveal scene, which we've had in every single Scream movie of the reveal of the killers, right. reveal of the motivation, the big running around who's going to survive this last event. But again, I just think it's wild. That's a significant amount of its runtime to the ending. And I think that as a filmmaker, I'm just kind of curious what you think of that kind of way to go about things. Yeah. When you think of like a scene, it typically comes with location change. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and sure, there's some there's location change in that like final uh, third act yeah. with like inside the house outside the house inside the van back in the house you know um so but at the end of the day it's still the one location it's pretty impressive uh you know if you think about like how you like break down and build a good scene or like a good movie for example it's it's uh you know by like sitting in <coughs> moments with you know dynamic characters and some sort of like 
power struggle or or challenge to overcome. And so many times, bad filmmakers try to tell these big stories that transcend time and place and you know yeah. like in five minutes are trying to get you from like you know three different like eras of time or something and but they as filmmakers Wes Craven's like putting you in this place in time with the characters for 40 minutes <laughs> and you get to savor all of that you know, that detail, I guess is what it is. Like you're not glossing over oh, things. No. You're, you're, <coughs> and when you're getting like story points, it's not through exposition. Although like it almost feels like it has sometimes because they're like turning the genre on its head with these like, like critiques of the genre, but it's not, straight exposition it's it's setting up your expectation to flip it on its head uh and that's kind of like a long way of saying that um it was pretty masterful in the way that all, while you're in one place for one extended period of time it moves and keeps you engaged the entire time that's amazing in a way that they've been able to do that with every film though <laughs> that's like okay one time sure two times what three times no way <laughs> it just like <laughs> keeps going and again i'm not always saying that the ghost face reveal or motivation is particularly like great but i think the fact sure. that you can build an entire like 50 minute ending is like kind of insane and amazing at the same time so this just again like i just think for people that maybe and I assume most people who are listening to us are of this age or have an understanding of this, but this just like this movie just did so much for the franchise. It just changed the trajectory of like mm. what horror was and kind of reinvigorated the genre in a way and showed us that it doesn't always have to fit in this exact like stereotype, which is just really amazing and yes okay we got a little overly saturated at certain points with this kind of meta critique but the fact that like we both still i think i think i might look at the new the requel like slightly harsher given that it's been a year but like i still thoroughly enjoyed it is just amazing and i'm so happy that despite the fact that Wes Craven's gone, that we're getting that the franchise is continuing on in a way that also feels very true to like the nature of scream and feels very like on brand mm. with him, which is awesome. There's almost like a little community around <laughs> this franchise, which I think is really cool and how like oh, they've yeah. gotten like, They've gotten the 90s babies involved and even older viewers who just appreciate what it did for the genre and then getting people back interested by doing the requel kind of thing. And I think that's just it's just so cool. It's so innovative. This franchise feels so different. And again, I'm not saying it's perfect or flawless. It is not. I think this first movie is like flawless. <laughs> I wouldn't really say that <laughs> about the other ones, but there's enjoyment in every one of those movies at some point that you're really going to cling on to and like, yeah. and it's again, one of those films that just, you can watch it alone. You can watch it in a group. You can watch it any time of year. You can have a great time watching this. And I just love this movie. So what are your big old last wrapping thoughts around this well all i'd say is that you just called it flawless so are you gonna change your three and a half star rating because i think you're coming around to my side with the four i'm like literally like i swear if there was a as close as you could get you want to, to a four, you want to this would be a uh, all right it's not a three and a half it's a three you know, here's all I'll say. Here's all I'll say. Three point eight five. If we're taking out just criticisms of like this wasn't enough or that wasn't enough in terms of like just being a cinephile and being a dick about it, and we're just talking about personal mm. enjoyment, 
if we're talking personal enjoyment, this is a four for me. There's not even a question. So I will give you that. <laughs> I'll give you that. You still have to finish your wrap up thoughts. You you threw it back to me, but you still need to finish your wrap up thoughts. Yeah, no, I mean, outside of being legendary and iconic, there's nothing else that needs to be said. <laughs> um, it, it hits all the notes you're looking for um, and brings something very new to the genre and had a lasting impact even outside the genre. Of oh, horror. yeah, yeah. Um, so... Uh, would love to hear additional thoughts from y'all out there does it deserve the props we give it do you have harsher critiques uh <laughs> as i as i side movies? eye the audience if you're watching on youtube as i side eye you if you are giving it <laughs> uh what are your thoughts what are you looking forward to with the the reboot franchise as always if you guys have recommendations or things you want us to cover please send us a message at pod under your bed at gmail.com or we are very active on our instagram account which again is under the handle of pod under your bed yes all right love y'all see you next Bye, guys time.